Good morning, everyone. Welcome to Thursday Bible Life today. We're going to finish our look into the Davidic covenant this morning. And we're going to begin in the book of Isaiah, chapter number 9, if you would like to get your Bible and turn there. From there, we'll be going to Ezekiel, chapter 34, and we'll finish up in the New Testament book of Luke in chapter number 1. Last week, we looked at the beginning of the Davidic covenant that we found in uh, 2 Samuel chapter 7, and we looked into uh, verses also in the book of Psalms, and uh, this morning we're going to continue our study of this Davidic covenant, and we'll see how that our interpretation and what we think about the Davidic covenant will have an effect on our thoughts about prophecy, and end-time events. And then vice versa, our thoughts about end-time events and uh, prophetical things that will happen at the end of the age will also have an effect on the way that we look at not only the Davidic covenant, but the Abrahamic covenant. And uh, we'll explain that as we move through our study today and as we draw things to a close at the end. Uh, we have a tendency uh, to... Uh, not think a whole lot about uh, the debates or the differences uh, in Christendom today about the Abrahamic covenant and the Davidic covenant. But when we look at them and consider what God's word says and how it's far reaching, speaks not only of things in the past and things present, but also things into the future, uh, these two particular covenants become much more important to us even though we are Gentiles in what's referred to most of the time as the Western world. So if you have your Bible, uh, turn with me to the book of Isaiah, chapter number 9. <clears throat> We're going to read a couple of very, very familiar passages today, this one in Isaiah and the one in Luke. Then we'll read one in between from the book of Ezekiel that is maybe not quite so familiar. This particular uh, book of Isaiah uh, was written, uh, a ballpark figure, sometime around 700 B.C. And it would have been after King David, after the Davidic covenant had been uh, given by God uh, through Nathan to David. And, uh, it, well, like I said, about 700 years before the birth of Christ. So I'm going to read chapter number 9 verses 6 and 7 from the book of Isaiah. For unto us a child is born, unto us a son is given, and the government will be upon his shoulder, and his name will be called Wonderful, Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace. Of the increase of his government and peace there will be no end. Upon the throne of David and over his kingdom, to order it and establish it with judgment and justice from that time forward, even forevermore. The zeal of the Lord of hosts will perform this. A couple of verses here, very familiar. We normally hear them around Christmas time. And uh, when it speaks about a child is born, I believe that references the birth of the Messiah Jesus in Bethlehem. When it says a son is given, I believe that that references when the Lord Jesus died a substitutionary, uh, a sacrificial death in our behalf on the cross. And so we consider this passage a lot of times at Christmas and then have a tendency to forget about it the rest of the year. It speaks about a kingdom that will have no end. And it's to be established on and run from the throne of David. You can't get any more Jewish than that. Sometimes people may think, well, this has already been fulfilled. It's already happened. Indeed, David did sit on the throne and God promised him uh, a kingdom and that his sons would succeed him and if they were obedient, they would receive God's blessings, and if they were disobedient, they would receive chastisement. 
But in that covenant, he said that he would never take away the spirit of the Lord from David and his descendants like he did from King Saul that David had witnessed. And so this speaks about a kingdom that will have no end. And certainly we understand that the kingdom of Israel, the nation of Israel came to an end. In fact, there was no country of Israel, uh, no Jewish people in their homeland for almost 1900 years. But in 1948, uh, they were recognized again by the United Nations as an independent autonomous nation in the land of Israel, although the boundaries of their property at that time were nothing near what they were in these Old Testament times and nothing near what they will be in what we think to be the uh, near future. So the book of Isaiah, the prophet Isaiah, uh, during the time of Hezekiah's reign, had these prophetic words to speak about the Messiah who would be a descendant of David and would sit upon the throne of David and he would rule over the kingdom that he would set up, which would have no end. The next time that we, uh, or the next passage that we look at will be from Ezekiel chapter number 34. If you'd like to turn there, we're going to begin reading in verse 20 and read through verse 24. Ezekiel, the time of his ministry and his life, was around 600 B.C., about 100 years after that of Isaiah. Ezekiel was one of the captives that was taken captive when the Babylonians uh, put up a siege around Jerusalem and three different times deported people from Israel to Babylon. Remember the famous uh, trio of uh, David's friends, Hananiah, Mishael, and Azariah, most of the time remembered as Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, who ended up in a fiery furnace, and God uh, miraculously saved them from that, and the prophet Daniel. Uh, those four guys were taken in the first deportation. Ezekiel was taken in the second one. And so he was given words of prophecy as he was in the land of Babylon. So I'll begin reading in Ezekiel 34, uh, verse number 20. Chapter 34, verse 20. Therefore, thus says the Lord God to them, Behold, I myself will judge between the fat and the lean sheep, because you have pushed the side and shoulder, butted all the weak ones with your horns, and scattered them abroad. Therefore, I will save my flock, and they shall no longer be a prey, and I will judge between sheep and sheep, and I will establish one shepherd over them, and he shall feed them, my servant David. He shall feed them and be their shepherd, and I, the Lord, will be their God, and my servant David, a prince among them, I, the Lord, have spoken. Uh, this is a portion of scripture that's not often thought about uh, when discussing prophecy, uh, but it speaks directly to the time that we recognize as the millennial reign of Christ, or the millennial kingdom, or the 1,000 year reign of Christ. It's spoken a great deal about in the 20th chapter of the book of Revelation. And a lot of people spiritualize or allegorize that and do not believe in a literal uh, reign of Christ that we refer to as the millennial kingdom. Uh, I believe that the Bible does teach without question that Christ will return and set up this kingdom and that he will rule over them at that time from the throne of David. And we'll talk more about that when we get into the next passage in the Gospel of Luke. But when Christ comes back to set up his kingdom, and my opinion is that uh, Christ will be the king and a resurrected David will serve as uh, a prince under the King Jesus during this 1,000 year millennial kingdom. And so that is the portion that we looked at from the book of Ezekiel. And now we'll turn our attention to the first chapter of the Gospel of Luke, another very familiar passage. We'll begin reading at verse number 26. This is the time when Gabriel comes to speak with Mary to tell her about that uh, fact that she's going to uh, conceive in her womb by the Holy Spirit and will bring forth a son and so forth. So we'll read Luke 1, 26 through 33. 
Now in the sixth month, and that refers to the sixth month of Elizabeth's pregnancy. Elizabeth was a relative of Mary, and Elizabeth was married to the priest named Zacharias, and uh, they were childless for many, many years, had always prayed for a child, especially a son, and they were finally answered, their prayer was finally answered, and they had a son, and he became John the Baptist. And it was during this six months that Elizabeth was pregnant with John the Baptist that this six months refers to. Now in the sixth month, the angel Gabriel was sent by God to a city of Galilee named Nazareth, to a virgin betrothed to a man whose name was Joseph, of the house of David. The virgin's name was Mary, and having come in, the angel said to her, Rejoice, highly favored one, the Lord is with you. Blessed are you among women. But when she saw him, she was troubled at his saying, and considered what manner of greeting this was. Then the angel said to her, Do not be afraid, Mary, for you have found favor with God. And behold, you will conceive in your womb, and bring forth a son, and shall call his name Jesus. He will be great, and will be called the Son of the Highest. And the Lord God will give him the throne of his father David, and he will reign over the house of Jacob forever, and of his kingdom there will be no end. Uh, so this is quite a scene, and it's very familiar to us. We hear it every year, uh, probably around Christmas time, especially if you've got kids or grandkids that are in some type of a Christmas play at church. You probably hear this so many times that you almost could say it without realizing it. So this may be one of the most recognized passages <clears throat> in the Christmas story. Yet the very substance of this passage and this prophecy that's given by Gabriel to Mary is oftentimes overlooked and not thought about the depth of it and the, the meaning of it, especially by Christendom today. And I'll explain that as we go. Gabriel is the angel that sent by God to tell people of things to come, like an announcement of something that God's getting ready to do in his redemptive plan for mankind. Remember, Gabriel is the one that appeared to Daniel and gave him the prophecy of the 70-week prophecy. And like I said a few minutes ago, Gabriel is the one that appeared to Zacharias as he was at the uh, table of altar of incense in the, t in the temple and Gabriel appeared to him and told him that his prayers had been heard and they were going to be answered and that he and his wife Elizabeth would give birth to a son. They would call him John and he would be the forerunner of the Messiah and make straight the way of the Lord to herald his coming. So Gabriel is uh, the angel that's sent with information of something that God's getting ready to do in his plan for man. And Gabriel's the one that came to Mary. And yet, what Gabriel told Mary, uh, which is a direct word from God, is uh, it absolutely requires that there is a literal millennial kingdom someday yet out into the future. We know it hasn't happened yet. And so, in order for God not to be a liar, that means it will happen sometime in the future. And uh, we believe that the Bible is God's word and it has no lies in it and it speaks truth and the real truth, and uh, it's not a moving target. Truth is truth. And uh, Jesus said in his prayer in John 17, when he was praying for his apostles and then for you and me, he said, Father, sanctify them by your truth. Your word is truth. So Gabriel told Mary this direct word from God that she was going to have a son and name him Jesus, and that he would inherit the throne of his father, David. This will be a direct fulfillment of the Davidic covenant. And so this means that any spiritualizing or allegorizing and not taking the 1,000 year millennial kingdom of Christ uh, serious and literal, uh, if you don't take it as literal, then according to scripture, you would be wrong. And it means that there will always be a nation of Israel and always be a Jewish people. 
This means that a literal geographical country called Israel has been and forever will belong to the nation of Israel, the Jewish people. And that is a direct uh, result of the Abrahamic covenant. And then it speaks about this kingdom and David's throne in Jerusalem. And that is a direct uh, reference and fulfillment of this Davidic covenant. And that means that Jerusalem will be, as it always has been, the capital of the nation of Israel. And that we never find anything in the Bible about a two-state solution. In fact, as you go through the last few chapters of the book of Ezekiel, uh, chapters 40 through 48, it speaks about life in this millennial kingdom and the way that people will worship and that uh, the Lord himself will sit as king over the house of Jacob, which means the kingdom of Israel, and it will be a kingdom that will have no end. So there will continue to be other nations and other ethnic groups throughout this millennial kingdom of Christ. Uh, as he rules over the house of Jacob and basically over all the universe from the throne of David in Jerusalem. But those other nations and ethnic groups will be subservient to the Lord Jesus Christ and to the nation of Israel. So how we interpret this issue of the Davidic covenant and also the Abrahamic covenant has a direct uh, relevance to how we interpret and understand prophecy and end time events that are yet into the future beyond the day in which you and I live. And vice versa, the way that we believe and interpret prophetical scriptures that we read in the Bible about these end time events will have a direct reference and uh, relevance to how we think about and how we accept the Abrahamic covenant and the Davidic covenant. There are a couple of different groups or several groups of people in the world today that have a tendency, although they maybe don't mean to on purpose, uh, to refute both the Davidic covenant and the Abrahamic covenant. Anyone in the world that does not believe that the Jews belong in the nation of Israel are going against what God said in the Abrahamic covenant. And anyone who does not believe in a literal kingdom that the Lord will set up and rule from the throne of David in Jerusalem, it will be a monarchy and uh, it will be a theocracy. God himself and the person of Jesus Christ will be ruling and reigning from the throne of David in Jerusalem. And so the people that think that the church has taken the place of the nation of Israel uh, to receive and to fulfill the prophecies given uh, into the future and into the kingdom age uh, are basically going against the Davidic covenant. So a lot of mainline denominations and groups of people in the world today uh, believe that God is finished with Israel and has no future plans for them. But the word of God uh, says just the opposite, that there will always be a nation of Israel and a Jewish people. And in fact, one day, uh, we believe not long from now, the Lord will return and set up this kingdom and rule from the throne of David in Jerusalem. It will be a complete and direct fulfillment of the Davidic covenant, in addition to the Abrahamic covenant. And God thought that those two covenants were so important that he made both of them unconditional. That means that there's nothing that man can do to negate them or to fulfill them. God will do it himself and bring it to pass. Well, that brings to a close our look at the Davidic covenant. But as we go through our uh, look at general prophecy on our journey from Genesis to eternity, there'll be several times as we go through our journey that we will refer back to uh, the references of the Abrahamic and Davidic covenant. So we want to keep them in the back of our mind. And next week we'll be looking again into some general prophetic passages uh, on our journey from Genesis to eternity. Father, thank you for today. Thank you for the blessings that you've given. Thank you for the promises of your word and the fact that we can count on them to be literally fulfilled. We look forward to one day 
when the Lord Jesus, the Messiah, returns and sets up his kingdom that will have no end. And he will rule for a thousand years from the throne of David in Jerusalem. Uh, we long for that time. In the meantime, Father, help us as your servants to be faithful in serving you. Help us that we might be aware of the opportunities you bring our way to share your word and your love with people who are in need. Thank you for these who join us online. We pray you continue to bless them and their families and their homes. In Jesus' name, we thank you and praise you. Amen. Until next week, I hope you have a great weekend. Lord bless you.